the Lux by Anna Godrison. On the morning of October 4, 1899, Elizabeth Adora Holland, the eldest daughter of the late Mr. Edward Holland, and his widow, Louise Gansford Holland, passed into the kingdom of heaven. Services will be held tomorrow, Sunday the 8th, at 10 a.m., at the Grace Episcopal Church at number 800 Broadway in Manhattan. From the obituary page of the New York News of the World Gazette, Saturday, October 7, 1899. Prologue in life, Elizabeth Adora Holland was known not only for her loveliness, but also for her moral character. So it was fair to assume that in the afterlife, she would occupy a lofty seat with an especially good view. If Elizabeth had looked down from that heavenly perch one particular October morning, on the proceedings of her own funeral, she would have been honored to see that all of New York's best families had turned out to say goodbye. They crowded Broadway with their black four-strong carriages, proceeding bravely towards this corner of East 10th Street where the Grace Church stood. Even though there was currently no sun or rain, their servants sheltered them with great black umbrellas, hiding their faces etched with shock and sadness from the public's prying eyes. Elizabeth would have approved of their somberness, and also of their indifferent attitude toward the curious workday people pressed up to the police barricades. The crowds had come to wonder at the passing of that perfect eighteen-year-old girl, whose glittering evenings had been recounted in the morning papers to brighten their days. A cold snap had greeted all of New York that morning, rendering the sky above an unfathomable gray. It was, Reverend Needlehouse murmured, as his carriage pulled up to the church, as if God could no longer imagine beauty now that Elizabeth Holland no longer walked his earth. The pallbearers nodded in agreement as they followed the Reverend onto the street and into the shadow of the Gothic-style church. They were Liz's peers, young men she had once danced with at countless balls. They disappeared to St. Paul's and Exeter at some point, and then returned with grown-up ideas and a fierce will to flirt. And here they were now, in black frock coats and morning bands, looking grave for perhaps the first time ever. First was Teddy Cutting, who was well known for being so light-hearted, and who had proposed marriage to Elizabeth twice without anyone taking him seriously. He looked as elegant as always, although Liz would have noted the fair stubble on his chin, a tell-tale sign of deep sorrow as Teddy was shaved by his valet every morning and was never seen in public without a smooth face. After him came the dashing James Hazen Hyde, who had just that May inherited a majority share of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. He had once let his face linger near Elizabeth's gardenia-scented neck, and told her she smelled better than any of the mademoiselles in the Faubourg Saint-Germain. After James came Broadie Parkerfish, whose family's townhouse neighbored the Hollands on Gramercy Park, and then Nicholas Livingston and Amos Freewood, who had often competed to be Elizabeth's dance partner. They stood still with downcast eyes, waiting for Henry Schoonmaker, who emerged last. The refined mourners could not help a little gasp at the sight of him, and not only because he was usually so wickedly bright-eyed and so regularly with a drink in hand, the tragic irony of Henry's appearing as a pallbearer on the very day when he was to have wed Elizabeth seemed deeply unfair. The horses drawing the hearse were shiny black but the coffin was decorated with an enormous white satin bow, for Elizabeth had died a virgin. What a shame, they all whispered, blowing ghostly gusts of air into one another's ears, that an early death was visited on such a very good girl. Henry, his thin lips set in a hard line, moved towards the hearse with the other pallbearers close behind. They lifted the unusually light coffin and stepped toward the church door. A few audible sobs were muffled into handkerchiefs as all of New York realized that they would never again look on Liz's beauty, on her porcelain skin, or the sincere smile. There was, in fact, no Liz, for her body had not yet been recovered from the Hudson River, despite two days of dragging it, and despite the handsome reward offered by Mayor Van Wyck. The whole ceremony had come on rather quickly, in fact, although everyone seemed too shocked to consider this. Next in the funeral cortege was Elizabeth's mother, wearing a dress and a veil in her favorite color. Mrs. Edward Holland and Louisa Gensvoort had always seemed fearsome and remote, even to her own children, and she had only become harder and more intractable since her husband's passing last winter. Edward Holland had been odd, and his oddness had only grown in the years before his death. He had, however, been the eldest son of an eldest son of a Holland, a family that had prospered on the little island of Manhattan since the days when it was called New Amsterdam, and so society had always forgiven him his quirks. But, in the weeks before her own death, Elizabeth had noticed something new and pitiable in her mother as well. Louisa leaned a little to the left now, as though remembering her late husband's presence. In her footsteps was Elizabeth's Aunt Edith, the younger sister of her late father. Edith Holland was one of the first women to move prominently in society after a divorce. 
It was understood, though very much not discussed, that her early marriage to a titled Spaniard had exposed her to enough bad humor and drunken debauchery for a whole lifetime. She went by her maiden name now, and looked as aggrieved by the loss of her niece as if Elizabeth had been her own child. There followed an odd gap, which everyone was too polite to comment on, and then came Angus Jones, who was sniffling loudly. Agnes was not a tall girl, and though she appeared well-dressed enough to the mourners still pressing against the police line for a better look, the black dress she wore would have been sadly familiar to the deceased. Elizabeth had worn the dress only once to her father's funeral, and then passed it down. It had since been let out at the waist and shortened at the hem. As Elizabeth knew too well, Agnes's father had met with financial ruin when she was only eleven, and had subsequently thrown himself off the Brooklyn Bridge. Agnes liked to tell people that Elizabeth was the only person who had offered her friendship in those dark times. Elizabeth had been her best friend, Agnes had often said, and though Elizabeth would have been embarrassed by such exaggerated statements, she would have never dreamed of correcting the poor girl. After Agnes came Penelope Hayes, who was usually said to be Elizabeth's true best friend. Elizabeth would have indeed recognized the distinct look of impatience she wore now. Penelope never liked waiting, especially out of doors. One of the lesser Mrs. Vanderbilt's standing nearby recognized that look as well, and made virtually an audible cluck. Penelope, with her gleaming black feathers, Egyptian profile, and wide, heavily lashed eyelids, was much admired, but very generally not trusted. And then there was the fact, uncomfortable to all assembled, that Penelope had been with Elizabeth when her body disappeared into the cold waters of the Hudson. She had, everybody knew by now, been the last person to see Elizabeth alive. Not that they suspected her of anything, of course, but then she did not look nearly haunted enough. She wore a cluster of diamonds at her throat, and on her arm, the formidable Isaac Phillips Buck. Isaac was a distant relation of the old Buck clan, so distant that his lineage can never be proved or disproved, but he was still formidable in size, two heads taller than Penelope and robust at the middle. Liz had never cared for him. She had always harbored a secret preference for doing what was practical and right over what was clever and fine. Isaac had never seemed to her like anything more than a taste monger. And indeed, the gold cap, now on his left canine tooth, matched the watch chain that extended from under his coat to his pants pocket. If the lesser Mrs. Vanderbilt, standing nearby, had said it aloud what she was thinking, that he looked more flashy than aggrieved, he would likely have taken it as a compliment. Once Penelope and Isaac passed, the rest of the crowd followed them into the church, flooding the aisle with their black garb on the way to the familiar pews. Reverend Needlehouse stood quietly at the pulpit as the best families of New York, the Schoonhorns and Van Pysters, the Hermans the, and the Bucks, the McBrays and Astors took their seats. Those who could no longer stop themselves, even under that lofty ceiling, began to whisper about the shocking absence. Finally, Mrs. Holland gave the Reverend a brusque nod. It is with heavy hearts, Reverend Needlehouse began. It was all he managed to say before the arched door to the church went flying open, hitting the stone wall with a resounding bang. The ladies of New York's polite class itched to turn and look, but of course decorum forbade it. They kept their elaborately coiffed heads facing forward and their eyes on Reverend Needlehouse, whose expression was not making that effort any easier. Hurrying down the aisle was Diana Holland, the dearly departed's little sister, with a few shining curls coming loose from under her hat and her cheeks pink from exertion. Only Elizabeth, if indeed she could look down from heaven, would have known what to make of the smile disappearing from Diana's face as she took a seat in the first pew.